No need to do that, Jackson heard, recognizing the voice of his wife's friend Becky, or Beck as her friends called her. He had just returned home from playing golf on Saturday a little earlier than he had intended. Looking out the open sliding patio door, he saw his wife and her three friends lounging by the pool and sipping mimosas. Diana, his wife, lay on a sun lounger with her back to the door. Beck was to her right, redhead Steph was directly in front of Dee, and Cheryl was to her left, lying on a towel by the pool. He stayed away so he couldn't be seen, wanting to listen. Sorry, Beck, but that's all I can think about. I felt it, and I can't stop thinking about how it would feel, his wife replied. You all talk about it. Besides, I'll be careful so Jackson won't find out. I won't be like Candace. Candace is their friend, telling the ladies endless stories of seduction and incredible nights. He will know. They always find out. You know what happened to me. And Candace is complete crap. I've been divorced for three years now. And I regret every stupid decision I made because of her. She became my downfall. And now she will become yours. Beck answered sadly. He heard his wife answer. It will be one time. And that's it. I need to know if size really matters, like Candace says. That's not true, Cheryl added. If you must know, in college, I had an affair with a guy. But after the initial passion wore off, it turned out that he was just another guy who didn't want anything else other than intimacy. Then I met Bert and realized that he could love me better than anyone else, with the greatest dignity. A guy with a lot of dignity exists only because of his dignity. In fact, he is not interesting at all. She took a sip. It's just a sporting event. And that's all. Damn it. No romance. Nothing at all. Steph, who has never been married, added, I warned you when you wanted to join our bachelor party, so that you never get attached to any guy you dance with. You may only want to dance, but they come to the club to have intimacy. The biggest problem you have is that you've started an affair with this guy. You're dating him, whether you know it or not. I'm not dating him. We drink, dance, and have a little fun, Diana said, until last evening. He told me that he has great dignity and wants to have a night with me. Until last night, I behaved well, until he showed it to me. Now that I've held it in my hands, I want to know what it feels like very much. She smiled. I fly away just thinking about him. Beck sat down and leaned against Diana. Understand, sister, Candace doesn't get or have incredible every night. She sits at home like me and is lonely. I know this, and that is where you are heading. I would give anything for a man like Jackson. He is nice and friendly to everyone. He has a good business and is a wonderful father. She stood up and tied a towel around her waist. This is your funeral, but I want to say here and now that when Jackson throws you away, I will do everything in my power to make him mine. Diana looked up at her friend. You don't understand. I have to do this, just once. Beck looked sad. It won't happen just once, and that's it. It doesn't happen like that. I know I've been there. Listening to this conversation, Jackson was overcome with anger. His wife, with whom he had lived for more than twenty years, was about to have intimacy with some guy she met at a club. He fought this in a fit of anger. He pushed the screen aside, knocking it off the railing, and rushed towards the pool. Diana felt a hand grab her left arm and pulled her up. She turned to face her husband. The rage in his eyes was noticeable to all the women. His right hand grabbed her wedding and engagement rings, and he pulled them off her left hand. My rings, she cried. Well, you are no longer my wife. So today, you can go have fun. In anger, he threw the rings over the roof onto the street in front of their house. Go have intimacy with your boyfriend with great dignity. He was shaking with anger and rage. I heard everything. I knew you weren't very good at bachelorette parties, but I couldn't believe you were in a relationship with some loser from a bar. Diana fell onto the concrete, crying. Steph stood up first and tried to console Jackson. Cool down, Jackson. 
She really didn't do anything wrong. Nonsense, he answered. You all knew what would happen when you started taking her to parties, especially you, Steph. He pointed his index finger at her. Since you're all here, help this, pack her things, and get them out of my house now. Cheryl smiled, the smile she used to control her husband. Come on, you can't be serious. She gently put her hand on his chest and suddenly found herself staggering and falling backwards into the pool. Jackson, having pushed Cheryl into the pool, turned away. I'll be gone for an hour, and when I come back, I don't want her in my house. Guess what? Steph has a new roommate. Jackson went into the house and then came back through the door because I heard you too, and I'm looking forward to our dates, but know that I won't have a night with you until the divorce is final. These won't be your friends anymore. Isn't that unacceptable to you? Beck stood up proudly. No, not at all. She couldn't help but smile. He was a real find. She was confident that she had learned from her past mistakes. A week later, she got her wish at Friday's bachelorette party. Beck watched Dee greet her boyfriend. She knew him. He was one of those nasty guys who come to clubs to prey on married women. She knew that he had once been the roommate of the man who had seduced her many years ago. It was something she would always regret. She knew that tonight Dee's life would change forever, just as her life had changed. She felt guilty for not trying to stop Dee, but she's known Dee since elementary school, and she knows that once Dee decides something, it's decided forever. She regretted not having photographed this seduction sooner. During the last couple of bachelorette parties, she had taken pictures with her phone to document her friend's behavior in the hopes of keeping her from making the same mistake she had made. To show Dee what she looks like in public, a married woman cheating on her husband. Now it appears she took these photos to take Dee's husband and make him hers. Maybe that's how it is, she thought. Dee didn't dance with her boyfriend tonight. She looked at her friends and said she'd see them later. With that, she greeted the man, and they turned and left the club. In a small, unkempt apartment, Dee felt butterflies in her stomach. In twenty-one years, this is the first man she has had other than Jackson. Undress me, he demanded as she reached for his fly. Her companion noticed that her wedding ring was missing. Put on the rings. I want to see them in your hand when you touch me, Dee replied. I cannot. Jackson took them when he kicked me out of the house last weekend. Why did he do this? Were you with someone else? She went on the defensive. No. He overheard my conversation with my friends about how I couldn't wait for us to have intimacy, so he snatched my rings and kicked me out. She saw that this man suddenly lost interest in her. Maybe Beck is right, and he only wanted to have a night with her because she's married, and the man is driven by his fetish. Don't you want to make love to me? He looked at her. She is attractive, but without a husband, if she feels good, he will never get rid of her. She doesn't interest him as a girl who needs a cheating wife. If I can get her so easily, then who can't damage goods, he thought. Here's the thing. Tonight, I'll give you what you want. You want him, and I know it. But after we have intimacy, you have to leave. I'm not interested in you hanging around here trying to be my girlfriend, and I'm not your boyfriend. I seduce married women because I don't need affection. With these words he grinned, he took off his pants and threw them on the sofa. He unbuttoned his shirt and added it to his trousers. He wasn't as fit as Jackson, but she didn't care. She knew what she wanted. Dee knelt in front of him. After a few minutes, he pushed her away and led her to his bed. She began to take off her clothes as quickly as she could and now she stood without clothes in front of him. He pushed her backwards onto the unmade bed. I know you liked it. He smiled at her, then went into the bathroom and closed the door. She felt sad, disappointed. Sure, it was big but the experience reminded her of her first time. Disappointment is the best way to describe it. As she drove back to Steve's apartment, she noted that it had only been an hour since she left the club with him. If she had a night with Jackson, she would be lying in his arms in the afterglow of lovemaking. She could go back to the club and meet the girls, feeling sad and lonely, 
with tears streaming down her cheeks. She took an Uber back to Steph's empty apartment. Jackson spent a week preparing for his new life. Some people would call him cold, but that's how he dealt with problems. Locked problems in small boxes. A successful business allowed him to delegate work so he could focus on what he needed to do. He knew that D would be served at work on Monday. He was not vindictive in his proposed settlement. They had been together for over twenty years, and she had been a good wife and mother to their son, until she decided she deserved the slumber party time she already had every week. Ever since he installed the pool, the girls would lie around it every weekend and get sober. He didn't mind too much, but sometimes he got tired of them being there every weekend while Diana was having a new experience. Jackson drove two hours to have dinner with their son on his college campus. He wanted to tell his son about the divorce man-to-man, -man, like his father. He calculated that his father had prevented future trouble by freeing his mother to find her new happiness. He knew his mother had a different opinion. The next day, Saturday after lunch, Jackson went home with his son. He hoped that this visit would not affect the boy's grades this semester. Steph asked Diana after dinner about her night with her lover. Was everything as you thought? Dee said she was disappointed after Candace's lustful tales and Steph's tales of her exciting life as a single woman. Dee thought she was going to have the best night of her life, but was only disappointed. Steph insisted that she needed the right partner, and she had just such guys. There are two guys she's dating. Each of them knew about the other's existence, and Steph was confident that she could talk them into debauchery with them tonight. The two couples dined and danced before returning to Steph's apartment. Obviously, Steph chose one of the two men, but her other choice was more than happy to get D. They lounged on the sofa. He was a good kisser, and she responded to his touch. Diana told a no, but he ignored her. She was soon disappointed. Is this her future? Incomplete pleasure with men who seem to only want pleasure for themselves without regard for her pleasure. She wriggled out from under him, went to the bathroom, and began to shower. I just wanted to wash it off. She felt dirty. She had intimacy with two different men in two nights, both of which were disappointing. The warm water felt nice, and as she lathered up, a cool breeze told her that someone had entered the shower with her. He grabbed her chest from behind. Hey baby, I love intimacy in the shower. Do you like having this in the shower? He pulled her towards him. Because he was bigger than her, she couldn't push him away. She reached behind the shower curtain, looking for something she could use to pull him away from her. Her fingers found a soap dish on the lip of the windowsill. She grabbed it with her left hand and smashed it on his head. The soap dish shattered into dozens of small pieces, stunned. He fell to the shower floor. Diana climbed over him and stood on the toilet seat, screaming for Steph, while Diana stood on the toilet seat, waiting to be rescued. Jackson was fast asleep on the couch. He's been sleeping there ever since he kicked Dee out. He could sleep in their bed, but he couldn't forget that she might have had other lovers in their bed. He woke up from a knock on the front door. He was wearing only boxers and a t-shirt and hesitantly walked towards the door. If he had looked through the peephole, he would not have opened the door. When he opened it, there stood the queen of debauchery herself, Candace. Physically, Candace was a beauty, a petite woman with a hot cheerleader body. Like Jackson, she owned her own business, a fitness center franchise where she personally trained overweight men and women. But Jackson always thought of her as a wormy apple that looked beautiful on the outside, but when you bit into it, it was rotten on the inside. It was already past one in the morning, and she was standing there in a little black dress. Jackson frowned. What do you want? She smiled her seductive smile that always worked. I thought you might need some good intimacy and I'd be happy to help. She lightly ran her fingers over his face, across his chest, and down. Very good, Jax. It will be wonderful. Never in my life, Jackson said, removing her hand. Go home. It will not happen. She looked girlish. Come on, I heard that you are no longer together, and this will be fun. Jackson pushed her back out of the doorway 
and closed the door in Candace's face. She smiled to herself as she walked back to her car. She liked it when a man played hard to get. On Sunday morning, Jackson did something he hadn't done in twenty years. He cleaned himself up and went to church. He was raised Baptist, but he wasn't sure he wanted to listen to a fire and brimstone preacher. There is a non-denominational church a few miles away. He arrived a few minutes before the service began and chose a seat a few rows back. He sat down in the middle of the row so that others wouldn't have to crawl over him to find a seat. The sermon was about allowing God to help you become the best person you can be so you can help others. Jackson felt touched and often felt like he wasn't doing enough for others. He is successful but has never felt motivated to help others. Maybe he should become a mentor to young people and teach them to be successful, leading by example, he thought. He felt very good until he returned home and saw Diana sitting on the steps. She jumped up and started screaming at him, Where have you been? I called. I came to you, and my keys don't work, and the access code to the garage doesn't work either. He calmly replied, If you really want to know, I went to church, and maybe instead of whoring around, you should find a church. I'm sure there are men in the church you can have a night with. She followed him inside after he unlocked the door. Dee wasted no time in starting to say that she wanted to go home, that she can't live with Steph, that her lifestyle is unproductive. No, you can't live here. I freed you from the oath that you were going to break anyway, if you haven't already. By the way, what was the intimacy that you just had to have? I don't, Dee didn't finish. She wanted to say, I didn't like it. But Jackson finished for don't lie. I've known you for too long, and I can tell that you've had this since you left here. There's no turning back. You know how I felt. Dee's thoughts went back to last year, when she told him she wanted to go to a bachelorette party with her friend. He bluntly stated that this would lead to her cheating on their marriage. It might be the first night or the hundredth, but she'll do it eventually. She didn't want to admit he was right. He told her that it was wrong for married ladies to act like single. It would only lead to trouble, and this trouble could affect his business. His clients may find out that she is his wife, and take their business elsewhere because she behaves badly. Dee tried to hug him, but he stopped her. Tomorrow, I'll ask Tracy, my new assistant, to make a list of safe apartments you can afford. I'll ask her to email them to your work email. From there, you can pick up your bedroom furniture and everything else you want. She cried, saying, I can't live on what I earn. You must help me. Jackson stood his ground. You never needed to work. I earn a lot of money, but you wanted a job. You've saved zero dollars, and you're blowing your paycheck as fast as you get it. You can't do this anymore. Being divorced, you will have to balance the budget. In addition, there are many families living on less than you earn. He walked her outside to the car. You will be served on wedding day at work, unless you want to go to Ab's office on Tuesday to be served quietly. On wedding day at work, Dee received the documents. Although she hoped that Jackson would not divorce her, she lived with him for more than twenty years and always got her way. Suddenly, she knew that the Jackson who loved her was different from the Jackson who decided not to love her. Alcohol was flowing freely at Cheryl's house on Wednesday night. The girls gathered together to cheer Dee up. Cheryl, Steph, and Dee were drinking too much too fast without food when Candace walked through the front door with a bottle of wine and a bottle of Jack Daniels. I don't understand what kind of party this is. As they continued drinking and tongues loosened, Candace announced that she was going to seduce Jackson. The tipsy ladies burst into laughter. Cheryl suggested, Girl, Beeks was first. Ha! Candace said, standing up and running her hands over her toned body. Does she really think her mommy body can compete with this? Candace admitted that she tried to seduce Jackson, but he rebuffed her. What are you thinking about, Dee? I think I could marry Jackson and never have to work again. Have plenty of intimacy with him and live comfortably, she grinned. Or maybe I'll marry him live with him for a while, and then get divorced. You know I can't be faithful. For the first time, 
Diana began to realize what she had done, while Dee started drinking even more. Jackson opened the front door to reveal Beeks and her children. She was holding a casserole dish in her hands. Thought you might need a friend tonight. They ate on the terrace. After the meal, Beeks and Jackson talked about how he felt about everything that had happened since he told Dee to leave. Her children played basketball in a basket in the backyard. I'm sure you know the others are with her now to help deal with the shock of today's service, and I would like to be with you. Thank you for your friendship. She didn't stay long. The children had school the next day. But before leaving, Beeks kissed Jackson tenderly on the lips. He smiled as their lips parted, a seductive kiss that lasted just the right amount of time. Jackson woke up sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m. It was a drunk call from Diana. She alternately cried and scolded him. How could you do this to me? Doesn't he love her enough? For him, this meant that it was Dee who didn't love him enough not to go to clubs and do God knows what while she was there. He would hang up and she would call back. After the third ring, he disconnected the call. We'll call her tomorrow when she sobers up. Jackson waited until eleven before calling her. She didn't apologize for the calls yesterday. He asked why she didn't call Tracy back about the apartment she found for Diana. She ignored this statement but instead wanted to go home. No, I know that you had a night with other men. So our marriage is over. You couldn't even wait to be served before having fun. I hope you've had everything you hoped for. A week, just a week, and you could wait to try other men. He heard a knock on the door and looked up to see Beeks with a paper bag in her hands. He raised his hand. Hey, give me a second to end the call. Exhaling, he continued, Diana, you wanted other men, and I'm giving you the life of a single divorced woman, which is what you obviously want. So, sign the papers. If you don't meet Tracy tomorrow, I'll sort out the apartment issue for you myself. I will pay the first two months of rent. That's all. I have to go. Beeks just surprised me with lunch. He turned off the call. By six o'clock in the evening, Stephanie was tired of listening to Diana. Girl, you have to give it up. Beeks isn't stealing your man. You don't want to hear it, but you were the one who wanted to try that guy, and you got him. What did Jackson get? He realized that he didn't have what his wife of twenty-some years wanted. Sorry, sister, but no man would want that. The Jackson I know won't take you back. Diana didn't want to hear it at all but you didn't try to stop me. Stephanie looked at her strangely. Why? When you want something, you go and get it. You've always been like this. Besides, I'm A, and I know it. You screwed up, and you want Jackson to pretend it never happened. You should be glad he doesn't know about the other things you did. Change into something nice, and let's cheer you up. Two weeks passed, and Diana had several new and disappointing lovers. On Monday night after work, Bert and Cheryl took Diana to see the apartment Jackson had rented for her. He furnished the apartment with furniture from the master bedroom and all her favorite things from home. Everything was freshly painted and cleaned, even the refrigerator was full. Bert was a good husband and brought her clothes into the apartment. As Cheryl asked, he hung up what needed hanging and opened the plastic containers that held folded clothes. He left and returned with food. They spent the evening with Diana, so Cheryl could ease Diana's loneliness on her first night in the apartment. Cheryl knew that her friend was trying to drag out the divorce in the hope that her husband would suddenly miss her so much that he would forgive her and take her back to her fairy tale life. She would never have told Diana that she knew that Beeks had lunch with Jackson several times a week. The longer this goes on, the worse Diana gets. Cheryl suggested having a housewarming baccalaureate party at Diana's new apartment on Friday. Beeks answered the call. It was Cheryl. Hello, sister. We're meeting on Friday at Dee's new apartment. Please come. I haven't seen you for several weeks. She paused. In recent months, the children's father did not pick them up. He works out of town, so I did not have the opportunity to go out somewhere. It was a little lie. She did visit Jackson but she stayed there for no more than an hour. I was just testing him. She knew he wouldn't cross the line, 
and have a night with her. I'll see if I can find someone to stay with them on Friday. They are teenagers, mother hen. They may be left alone, of course not for long, but someday I may need to get my security deposit back. Jackson looked forward to dinners with Beeks. She knew from her friendship with him that he rarely left his office for lunch. He is a stickler for lunch from home, which is probably why he has been successful. It's such little things. She works just two blocks from Jackson's work. It wasn't every day, but he enjoyed her company. She is Diana's only friend that he liked. He only tolerated the others to keep the peace. While having lunch with Jackson on Thursday, Beeks asked if he would watch the kids so she could go to Diana's housewarming. He replied, Certainly. Jackson enjoyed her children. Three boys, ages thirteen, fifteen, and sixteen looked up to Jackson as an uncle, a cool uncle who played parrot-pair basketball with them when they came to visit. He really missed playing basketball with his son. These guys helped him fill that void. Beeks didn't have to drop the kids off, because Jackson showed up and took them to the baseball fields and go-kart racing. She paused and took a breath before knocking. Come in, she heard through the door. Peering through the door, she saw Cheryl and Steph, with their glasses of wine raised. But before she could walk through the doorway, Candace pushed past her into the room. Hey! Candace barked. She was already under pressure. She heard the toilet flush, and Dee came into the room. There was tension between Beeks and Dee, unspoken for now, but it wouldn't last all evening. After drinking wine and whiskey, tongues loosened. Drunk. Cheryl believed that they should all help Dee get back to Jack's. This hurt Beeks inside. She had real feelings for Jackson, not Jack, but Jackson. A tipsy Candace told the girls that Dee couldn't get him back until she had intim with him. She stated that when she paid him, he felt nice in her hands, not too big, but not too small, her perfect size for optimal pleasure, as she called it. Beeks called her out for talking like that. But Candace replied, Oh, that's right. Little Mommy has plans for Jaxi. Do you think you can get him? Mommy needs a daddy for her children. And he is an empty nest. Why should he raise your children? She knew that her friends were superficial. Her ex always liked to point this out to her. But hearing Candace talk about her Jackson like that was too much. Before she could argue with Candace, Dee pulled back her hair and shouted at her. Stay away from my husband, Beeks. He's mine, so get thee away from him. I saw you leaving his office several times when I drove by during lunch. Dee pushed Beeks towards the door. At the open door, Beeks expressed her thoughts to her friends for the first time in her life. Cold. I understood everything, Dee, but he is no longer yours. You threw him away, preferring other men to him. He doesn't deserve this. Remember, I know how many men you've pleased below the belt at bachelorette parties. Steph says you've tried a lot of men since you moved in with her. Cheryl, you think you can have a boyfriend any time, because Bert knows his wife is taller than him. And that may be true, but cheating is not okay. I learned this the hard way. You never had children because you didn't want a mom body, but it's an honor you'll never know. Steph is so shallow that she will never marry. No man needs a woman like you. Of course, they will invite you on dates with the obligatory continuation, but they don't need you for anything else. And Candace, if every man you had intimate with could stick out of your body like a needle, you'd look like a porcupine. After a pause, she continued, I'm not chasing Jackson. I'm trying to give him the space he needs, but now the cards are open. I'll come for your husband, Deed know that when he becomes mine, he will never think about either of you again. I have learned from my own experience that a good husband is very, very difficult to find. He will never regret being with me. I promise that. With these words, she left, slamming the door. Beeks went home and sat in her empty apartment for half an hour. The boys were with Jackson, and she didn't want to be alone. She took out her phone and dialed Jackson's number. He told her to come down. Their turn at the baseball practice booth would be in half an hour. He joked that his fifth place hurt after go-karting. 
She found Jackson and her children in the outfield baseball booth. She sat down on a bench behind the fence. Her older sons did not need his guidance, but the youngest did. She smiled as she watched her father spend time with them. Jackson smiled the entire time. His smile grew even wider when he saw her watching them. He motioned for her to come inside. Silently handing her a baseball helmet, she shook her head, but the children insisted, and here she stands with a bat on her shoulder and swings for innings, missing every one of them. Jackson slid behind her and took the bat off her shoulder. He told her to bend her knees and helped her swing for the next pitch. To her surprise, she hit the ball. Not a hit, but not a miss either. She felt so safe with Jackson pressed against her from behind, helping her prepare for her swing. She felt her pulse begin to quicken. She never managed to hit the ball on her own, but it was the most fun she'd had in years. She laughed until she cried. She will always remember this evening as the one when she realized that she loved Jackson. Jackson smiled as he followed Beek's car to her apartment. She told Jackson that he didn't have to follow them home, but he just smiled. He helped her get the boys and carry their things into the apartment, and then asked if she wanted to have breakfast with him the next morning, and she agreed. While driving back home, he received a message from Bert. It seems that the girls left Dee's apartment to go to the club. They were stopped on the road, and they ended up in the sobering station. He told Bert that everything depended on him, but he decided that they needed a lesson and did not pull them out. Looks like drunk driving increased your insurance, he mused. He wondered if Diana was the driver. Over breakfast, Jackson and Beeks continued to bond as a couple. She told him about the previous evening at Dee's and what she said there. He thought it was funny that she told them off. He wondered why she left so early but hoped she did it for his sake. He knew it was selfish, but everyone wants something like that. I'll be honest with you. Last night when I held you in the batting cage, it felt right. I think maybe you felt it too. She nodded in agreement. I felt safe and protected. She blushed as she said this. To be honest, I already fell in love with you many years ago. Well, I think I'm in love with you. I know that you are married, but I will wait for you as long as necessary. She dug into her purse and pulled out an envelope. I know I have a story, and you know what it is. The day you kicked D out, I said I would do anything to be with you. I knew you would need something specific to show my intentions. The following Monday, I got tested for SSTEs. You will see that I am clean. I haven't had intimacy with a man for over a year. To be honest, he was so proud of her honesty. Beeks, I know you made mistakes. I was there in the days before your divorce, and I saw the regret. I knew that you were always a good person, but I still didn't understand why you continued nightly dates when it led to divorce, he asked. She looked down. You don't understand now, and I hope you never understand. But when you're divorced and with children, you can't date. But you want to feel loved, even when you know that you're not Miss Right, but just Miss Right now. Since we're being honest, I feel the same way. But look at me. I'm not like others. I don't go to the gym. I get judged for my mom's body. I don't have money for this. It's hard to feed three teenage boys with what I get. Child support doesn't even cover their food. He squeezed her hands with his. You look great. You are beautiful and curvy. I like curvy ones. He smiled devilishly. I can't wait to see those curves. The waitress brought their check and smiled at the comment. He took the check from the table as they stood up, looked at her, and smiled. So, do you have any plans for today? Beeks pressed her whole body against him and, rising lightly, kissed him on the lips. Well, there's something I haven't done for a long time. It's been over a year now. Jackson stood in his underpants and looked at himself in the bathroom mirror. He was about to have intimate with the first woman in twenty-five years other than his soon-to-be ex-wife. After he found out that Dee was unfaithful, he felt insecure. Beeks seemed like a hot woman to him. His father would have said volume in those places where it should be. He took a deep breath and opened the door, expecting to find her sitting on the bed waiting for him. 
He was surprised to find her lying under the covers, pulled up to her chin. Jackson was slightly disappointed. He wanted to turn her around and told her so as he pulled back the top covers and moved into Beak's bed. You can turn me around another time. When I feel more comfortable, this is something new for me. And I don't want you to be disappointed in my body. Jackson pressed his body against her without clothes. The warmth of her full, large chest felt exciting on his skin. You can never disappoint me with your body, no matter what the ex looks like. She looks like that for herself, not for me. Because I've always been turned on by curvy girls. He placed his right hand on her left leg and slowly moved it along her thigh and up to her under chest area. Then returned it to her hip and moved it down, touching her plump fifth place. He leaned down and kissed her for the first time. Her breath caught in her throat as they kissed, exploring each other tenderly until the warmth building below them grew into flames. Their kisses became more passionate, as if they wanted to devour each other. She rolled onto her back, and he threw his right leg over her, as if holding her up as they continued to kiss passionately. His right hand moved up her soft belly, over a ribcage to her ample chest. Her right hand touched his stomach as she reached down to his boxers and found what she was looking for. Exhausted, she collapsed onto his chest, breathing heavily. It had been too long since she had done something like this, or rather not like that. She had never had anything like this. Her ex and most of the men she dated after her divorce never tried to please her. These men, including her ex, only wanted pleasure for themselves. She knew that this was what men wanted, but it never gave her pleasure. Jackson put her on top of him and hugged her tightly. He would always cherish this moment. He felt like a man again. He didn't understand what Dee had done to him, but he knew it had an effect on him. He continued to hug her as they both drifted off to sleep. Jackson was the first to wake up. He looked at Rebecca lovingly. His mind transformed her. Beeks was Diane's friend. Beeks was a fun girl, but Rebecca was the mature woman he thought he might fall in love with. He enjoyed spending time with her and enjoyed spending time with her boys. He had no idea how much he missed being a father. He kissed her, waking her up. Rebecca, he said for the first time. I don't know where this will lead, but I don't want to see any other women but you. I can't assume you feel the same way, but I'd love it if you did. She kissed him. I wouldn't want anything better. Rebecca smiled until she saw the alarm clock. Oh, it's already been more than an hour. The boys will be worried. Getting out of bed, Jackson saw her body for the first time and was pleased. She may have thought she was overweight, but he thought she was perfect. Can I use your shower? Of course, he said, thinking about joining her in the shower, but knew that being a mother was more important at this moment. He didn't stop her from getting dressed, but walked her to the car and kissed her. I would like you to bring the boys in a couple of hours. I want to be sure that they don't mind the fact that I'm dating their mom, he asked. She smiled very caring. When Rebecca returned with her sons, she found Jackson had hamburgers on the grill and potato salad, beans, and relish on the table. After they ate, Jackson pulled the boys aside while she cleared the table. They sat around the fire. Guys, I want to talk to you like men. I really like your mom and would like to date her romantically if that's okay with you. It's important that you approve because I really like you too. Can I date your mom? The three guys looked at each other. No man had ever asked them such a question before. None of the boys said anything to each other. The two younger ones looked at their older brother and nodded. The eldest son, the owner of the house, looked at Jackson. Yes, sir, we would like that. Jackson stood up, and the boys stood up, and he hugged them. Jackson heard the younger one ask, Will you be our new dad? He hugged them even tighter. If that's what you want, I'd be honored. Rebecca began to cry as she watched this happen. Her boys needed a man in their lives just as much as she did. A man who would be a good example for young people when they grow up. She reached for a tissue to wipe away her tears as she watched the younger one grab a basketball from the closet and run towards the basketball court 
while Jackson and his brothers waited to play a regular game of doubles. As she was putting away a trash bag filled with scraps from their meal, Rebecca heard the doorbell ring. Jackson, someone is at your door. While playing basketball, he didn't hear her. She wiped her hands on a kitchen towel, walked through the patio doors into the house, and headed for the front door. The bell rang again. As she opened the door to meet Dee, Rebecca fell on her back as Dee pushed her into the house. What are you doing in my house? Dee growled at her. Rebecca stood up and pushed Dee back a step. This is not your house anymore. This is Jackson's house. You live in an apartment on Richard Street. Remember how you kicked me out last night? As Dee walked past Beck, she looked for Jack. Where's my husband? I spent the whole night in prison. He had to come and get me out. Rebecca rushed to intercept D, who came face to face with her. Why do you think he had to get you out of prison? He is my husband. This is his responsibility. No, it's not his responsibility to get you out of the sobering center. It is your responsibility not to get arrested for public drinking. Take responsibility for your life. Beeks was angry at her old friend. D rushed from room to room, but Rebecca stayed behind her. I know why you are here, but it won't work. You left him, and I'm trying to be there for him, so that he doesn't go into the darkness that my ex went into. She put her hands on her hips and looked into Dee's eyes. You were where I was three years ago. You screwed up and lost your husband because you did stupid things a married woman shouldn't do, and you will pay the price for it. Loneliness is a hard price to pay. Every evening I return home to a cold, quiet apartment, never again to hear the sweet, gentle sounds of a loving husband and children. I'm lucky to have children, but your son has grown up, and your husband is divorcing you. It will be hard because you will be lonely, and at forty-five years old, sitting at home on weekday evenings while you wait for Friday and Saturday evenings when you can find some man, anyone who will warm your bed. I didn't plan this, but I made love to Jackson this morning. She raised her hand. You and I both know something. We both know he's an incredible lover. So caring, so passionate. She smiled to herself. This is such a rarity, Dee cried. I'm so stupid. You're so right. He is wonderful, and he is the best lover I have ever had. I forgot about it. I thought I'd have an adventure he'd never know about and I'd get to try something better than intimate that happens once in a lifetime. She paused. I already had it, Dee whispered. The ex walked to the patio door. Jackson is outside with the boys. I can go get him. Dee stood next to her friend and watched the basketball go through the hoop from Jackson's throw. He is a great father. I had forgotten how much I enjoyed watching him play basketball. She looked at her friend. Do you love him? Yes, BX announced. I want you to know that today was our first time. I don't know if he loves me as much as I love him, but if he chooses me, I will spend the rest of my life making him happy. We are both going through menopause in the near future, and I know it will change things, but Jackson seems like a man who will understand and find a way to make it work for us. Diana sobbed. I actually came here today to seduce him again to make love to him one last time, even if it's miserable in him. If he makes love to you, it's over, and he's moving on. I know how he does everything. He wouldn't do this if I had the chance. Dee turned and walked back to the door. She stopped at the door and turned around. Tell him that I will find a lawyer and sign the papers. Rebecca told Jackson about Dee's visit and that her lawyer would contact his lawyer. He gathered her and the boys and sent them home. He kissed her tenderly and closed the car door. Seven months later, Dee asked for a short meeting with Jackson and his lawyer before they appeared before a judge. Jackson knew Diane needed some form of closure. She asked for forgiveness for being selfish and touchy, that she had forgotten how incredible he was, how she regretted that she even started hanging out with girls. She knew he never wanted her to do this and told her so. Diana, I tried to explain to you that married women cannot behave like unmarried women. I knew you weren't faithful to me at the bachelorette parties. You were always seen by someone you didn't notice. Over the years, I received photos, 
and text messages from people who saw you in clubs and restaurants, but I chose to ignore it because I loved you. But enough is enough. Coming home that Saturday and hearing you talk about how you were going to get that guy, I knew it was all over for me. If you don't want me, then let him have you. He got up. Have a nice life, Diana. You will always be a part of my life. We have a son, and there will be times like birthdays and holidays when we see each other. I will be polite and friendly. I will be available in case of emergency. But we will never sleep in the same bed again. I've always been a one-woman man, and that will never change. He closed the door behind him, and Diana burst into tears. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.